Don't worry about me. I'm just looking at you all. Uh, just on. It's a good vantage point. Now we're waiting for the live streaming to start. So when I get the thumbs up, we go. There we are. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all and to introduce our speaker, Mark Oppenheimer. And I'm going to start by telling you something that's not on his CV at all, yeah. which is very short. Um, and it's personal, and I hope when I do this I don't choke up, so I'm going to try and be uh, macho about it. Uh, I have a schizophrenic, my wife and I have a schizophrenic daughter, and it's a long and complicated story, but she was declared an involuntary state patient, and they wanted to lock her in a state psychiatric institution, and we wanted to get her out. And I called Mark to ask, and I hope he doesn't mind me telling you this, I'm not looking at him in case he shakes his head or says no. <laughs> uh, uh, I asked Mark uh, if he could help us uh, bring a legal action against the state uh, to have our daughter freed, released, uh, from involuntary detention. And uh, I said, you know, we don't have a deep pocket or a big budget, uh, can he tell me what it's likely to cost, and he said immediately, without hesitation, he would act pro bono. Uh, that meant a lot in the sense that he doesn't owe me anything. We, at that stage, were hardly even good friends. Now we're friends. I don't know if I could call him a good friend, but, uh, but certainly uh, that's the caliber of the man. Uh, he's a, he's a, he's a uh, very proficient counsel in South Africa at the Johannesburg Bar. And uh, he had no hesitation in saying he would like to fight that case. And it would have been a case fought on, on uh, very complex legal principles. Uh, at the moment, the state, uh, through I forget the exact detail of the law, but it's something like two psychiatrists can basically certify somebody and lock them away for the rest of their lives. As it happened, our somewhat catatonic and very mentally ill daughter uh, found a way to climb over the fence and run away, so we never needed to bring the case. And uh, then they said the police were after us because we were harboring an involuntary state patient, which is a criminal offence, and they were coming to arrest us and because we wouldn't tell them where she was. And I said, please do, uh, please take me to jail. I want this to go to court. I want this to become a constitutional case. Poor old Mark had no idea what he would have been in for had it run the full course. Uh, but as it happens, after many threatening calls, the police didn't arrive, and uh, so we haven't had to draw on him. But I just want you to know that's the person we're dealing with here, a man of extraordinary generosity and integrity, uh, a very substantially uh, brilliant lawyer, um, and somebody who is really worth listening to. Uh, the issue on which he's... Uh, addressed us here before and on which he's done parliamentary presentations is the question of free speech. And uh, on that he's truly outstanding. If you get a chance to hear him on the subject, make sure you don't miss it. And uh, or for that matter, go on to our website and look at the podcast of the talk he gave in this very room on that subject. Um, as I said, he's an advocate at the Janusburg Bar. He's represented newspapers uh, that were threatened with defamation suits. Uh, that, for me, is an interesting philosophical question ever since my own legal studies. I've never really been decided where I stand on the question of defamation. Is, should it really be an actionable offence or should it be a matter of free speech? It's, uh, to me, an interesting and difficult uh, philosophical question. And, um, and uh, he's... Uh, fought for individuals who were wrongfully arrested by police. Now, by the way, I get wrongfully arrested regularly because I refuse to stop at roadblocks. Um, I ask them for their warrants. They say they want my driver's license. I say, no, I want your warrant. And they say, no, go. And I say, no, no, I'm stopping because you're running in the real... And they always arrest me. They arrest me and then I say, good, <laughs> now, now please charge me. And they never do. And of course, I have in the back of my mind that I will have this very substantial council <laughs> <laughs> who pro bono <laughs> will represent me for defying roadblocks. And I'm just astonished that South Africans accept roadblocks, that innocent people going about the, like in the old past laws get stopped and 
and you get searched and you get told to present your driver's license, which is yours. And uh, it just amazes me that I'm, I, I think I'm from the wrong planet. I'm the only person who thinks it's wrong and the only person who demands of them. And they tell me to go and I say no. Until they arrest me, I demand to see their, their warrant for the roadblock depending on whether it's technical, whether it's the Police Act or the Traffic Act, different rules apply, which he would have to represent me on in my <laughs> challenge. So he represents sort of crazy people like me. He's represented um, uh, 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 owners who have been uh, mistreated by municipalities. Uh, he's uh, done presentations in Parliament on the question of free speech and laws and legislation threatening free speech. Uh, I think that's perhaps uh, one of his great areas of interest and speciality. He's appeared on the Renegade Report, ANN7, which he admits to, uh, CNBC, Africa and others. Uh, he's written articles on non-racial affirmative action, property rights, uh, and threats to free speech in politics, web, business day, city press. And uh, it's my pleasure to hand you, so to speak, uh, Mark Oppenheimer, who is, uh, for reasons I've given, uh, someone who means a lot to me personally. Uh, Mark, over to you. Well, Leon, thank you so much for such a marvelous introduction. Um, speaking of um, putting in your hard work and getting paid nothing like pro bono lawyers, we can talk about the state expropriating your land. So, to my mind, expropriation without compensation is the greatest threat that we face as a nation at the moment. If we implement a policy which leads to this on a wide-scale basis, it'll destroy our economy, it'll imperil jobs, uh, and lead us to uh, the rack and ruin that we see in, uh, in Zimbabwe and Venezuela. And that's why my presence today is about how to stop it. Okay. But before we learn how to stop it, I think we need to cure ourselves of some myths. So there are a number of myths that are prevalent about land reform, and I think I'm going to try and take you through a few of those. Um, and it's important that we, that we fight back against these myths uh, with the truth. So myth number one is that the land has not been given back to its rightful owners. Now as a lawyer who cares deeply about justice, I'm going to say that if your land was taken from you unjustly, you are deserving of compensation. So if you owned land and it was taken from you by the apartheid state um, unlawfully or unfairly, you are deserving of compensation. Now there's two different ways that compensation can happen. The one is that the original land is given back to you and the other is that you're awarded financial compensation. Now what we've got to recognize um, is that this has been an ongoing process and has been from 1995 to 2014 and that during this time 1.8 million individuals have received their land back or received money. So I'll give you a little bit of a breakdown of the stats. So this shows you by province um, exactly how much land was restored um, and it shows you on a national level as well. You can see the number of cases that were run in the land claims court. People were given an opportunity to present their case to say this is the land that I used to have uh, this is how it was taken from me, and I want, uh, I want compensation. And as I say, 1.8 million individuals have received that. If we look at the number of cases that were dealt with, so we had 79,000 cases that were brought. Often it's brought on behalf of a community. Um, so we can see that there are uh, 370,000 households. Uh, and we can see that of those almost 80,000 cases that were brought, 77,000 of them have been resolved. So this is... 95% of cases up to 2014 have been resolved. Now why have I stopped at 2014? It's because there was basically a period of time for people to bring land claims which was capped at 2014. There was then a move to extend the land claims process. Uh, the Constitutional Court found that this extension um, was procedurally irregular. They didn't have the proper consultations and so what we've had is a number of claims that have been sitting in abeyance um, that cannot be dealt with because there is no governing legislation to deal with them. So what we have are the small number of claims, I think it's roughly a, a few thousand that need to be resolved under the, under the old dispensation, um, and then a move could be made at some point to use the same process that's been done, which is the judicial process. So what's the second myth? 
Well, that myth is that there is this hunger for land, that the people just want the land right now, right? Now, there's a couple of problems with this. Firstly, as I mentioned, when you had the compensation process, most people didn't actually ask for their land back. Okay? In some cases, that land is sacred land. It's uh, where your ancestors are buried, or it has a particular symbolic impetus for you, uh, or you really want that land. But that's only 8% of cases. In 92% of cases, people said, I'd rather have the money, please. Now, there's good reason why people choose the money. Money represents freedom. Firstly, with the money, you can go and buy the piece of land that you want, uh, not the piece of land that you would have been allocated in the rural areas. You know, if you're a, a modern person, having a, a stretch of land in uh, the middle of the Northern Cape isn't going to be very useful for you. You might want to use that money to start a business, to pay off your debts, um, you know, to invest in the market. So why do people choose money? Uh, they don't ask for land. Uh, the IRR has done some polling on this, and they asked the Africans, what are the burning issues for you? You can see at the top there, okay, 39.7% of people say unemployment. So almost 40% say unemployment is the issue. Then a third say service delivery, water, lights, roads. You can keep going down, and right at the bottom, land distribution at 0.6%. Okay. Um, almost no one sees this as a big issue. There is no genuine hunger for land. What we have um, are a small minority of people that are incredibly vocal. Uh, as politicians, you have to hand it to them that they've managed to turn this non-issue into something that energizes people. And part of that is because there is this symbolic thing in land. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, for some people, that particular piece of land is sacred. You know, my ancestors are buried there. If you think about what, uh, what the Nazis did, they would refer to our land, our German land that was taken from us. You know, we need to unite together to get our land back. It's a very kind of like blood and soil kind of thing to say. And the EFF do an incredible job of pushing this issue. Uh, you have Black First Land First, whose uh, slogan is land or death. Okay. But the average South African, not interested. Myth number three is that anyone can be a farmer. It's just like um, the vegetable garden that you have in, you know, uh, back home. It's very easy. Anyone can do it, except it's not. <laughs> it's a highly technical thing. I mean, if someone had to expropriate my legal practice and then walk into it, what would they have? They would have nothing because they don't have my skills. They don't have the years that I've put into learning about the law and its intricacies. With farmers, it's generational. If you think about people that run wine farms, it's hundreds of years of passing down arcane knowledge. It's using highly specialized equipment. And that's just the technical stuff involved in producing your produce. There's all the business stuff involved as well, you know, supplier relations, you know, dealing with fluctuating weather conditions. So it's not a simple thing that anyone can just be a farmer. And we find this is exactly what happens in practice. So government has spent 1.4 billion rand um, buying farms. Okay, and this is just a particular instance in Eastern Cape. And they said, we'll buy 264 farms and we'll redistribute them. So they were paying compensation in these cases, as they ought to have. Um, and what do we find? Only 26 of those farms still function. So a 90% failure rate. And it's not surprising because you're dealing with a very technical endeavor. Very well illustrated by the cartoonist germ here. You, know, you can see exactly the situation where it's, uh, here's just a few things to you know, get you going so you can learn a bit about my arcane field. And very quickly you realize, can I have the money, please? You know? So myth number four. This is one uh, peddled by our president, Ramaphosa. He said, don't worry, EWC won't hurt the economy. And I'm of the view that this is akin to saying that um, a vow of celibacy won't affect your sex life. <laughs> Unfortunately, the two are intricately connected. If you remove property rights, you are sentencing the nation to failure. And what is amazing about South Africa, of course, is the sense of South African exceptionalism. You know, we have an incredible story to tell. You know, we were a country on the brink of civil war, and we managed to negotiate our way out of that, and we generally have a peaceful society. And partly because of that, we say, well, we can do things other nations have tried and failed, and we'll get it right. So let's try expropriation on compensation, while forgetting that it's been tried in Zimbabwe, and it's been tried in Venezuela. If we look at what's happened in Zim, it's not just those farmers um, that have been hard done by. They have a 90% unemployment rate in Zimbabwe. You know, a lot of Zimbabweans live in South Africa. They are driven into exile because of how bad uh, that decision was for their economy. 
In Venezuela, what you have at the moment, every time I give a talk like this, I have to update the figure. So to give you an idea, the last time I was on TV talking about this, I said the inflation rate was 876,000%. Okay? Looked a few days ago, it's 1.3 million percent. Okay? Uh, they're, they're going to beat Zim. <laughs> okay? That's an incredible record to try and beat. Um, you have mass starvation. Uh, you have millions of people fleeing Venezuela. Now, Venezuela was the richest country in South America. They have the world's biggest supply of oil in the world. So it's incredible to have this gift, this natural gift that you have, and you throw it down the toilet because of a terrible economic policy. Within 20 years of socialism, they've managed to uh, destroy a nation. Um, but don't worry, South Africa is different. When we do it, it won't damage the economy. Just a little reminder uh, of what that looks like. This is a hundred trillion dollar note. Okay. Um, we can look forward to seeing this in RANDs if we implement uh, expropriation or compensation. Um, and uh, we can buy this, uh, these, this group of tomatoes with uh, these Venezuelan bolivars, as you can see, stacked up. That's uh, how many tomatoes you get. Uh, th this picture is a few months old, so I can't guarantee that you'll get that many tomatoes anymore. <laughs> Myth number five is that the only way that we can have justice, the only way that we can have true land reform is without paying compensation, because paying compensation is unaffordable. It's an outright lie. It's an outright lie because if we look at how much money is dedicated towards land reform at the moment, it's 0.3%. It is an absolute rounding error for an issue that has been consuming our presses uh, for over a year now, okay, that this is the issue of the nation. The government says, ah, we'll allocate 0.3% of the budget to deal with it. If it really is the issue which they think it is, well, you can allocate more money. Um, you know, we, we're talking about such a tiny proportion of our budget. So there's something very disingenuous in that. Also, once you start interfering with property rights, well, where does the budget come from? It comes from taxes. Okay? So you're going to destroy the economy, which means that you're going to have a lot less revenue available for all the other schemes that government has in mind. Right? I mean, this is one among many uh, socialist or communist practices the government is keen on, like NHI, like free education. Um, those things cannot be funded uh, if you scare off your taxpayers, who will leave in droves um, because they'll have to abandon their property once it's seized by the state. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an amazing graph that's been going around which shows you inequality in South Africa. And there's something quite sobering about it. Um, so what, what they ask you to do is to guess what percentile you're in in terms of earnings in the country, and then it shows you where you actually sit. turns out that if you earn more than 11,000 Rand per month, uh, you're in the top 5%. Okay. If you earn more than 48,000 Rand a month, you're in the top 1%. Okay. Now, the idea of this graph is to make you feel immense guilt at the fact that you earn this money and to say, oh, you know, this rarefied elite. Here's the thing. It just shows you how fragile South Africa really is. If that 1% says, you know what, we're sick of being abused by the state. We don't want our property confiscated. We're going off to one of the other places that we have um, you know, citizen rights to. We're going to go to... Australia, or the UK, or America, or Israel, or wherever else, um, you know, as people are fond of saying, go back to Europe, fine, we'll leave. If you leave, what do you think is going to happen to the tax base? That 1% contributes an enormous amount to the rest of the country. Those people are saints. Those people are paying for roads, for education, for hospitals. Uh, you don't want to see them leave. Final myth is that the Constitution impedes land reform. And this is why the move to try and change the Constitution, to say that this document is a traitorous document. Um, the South African people were sold out um, through uh, negotiations with the National Party, and we have to change the Constitution, uh, or else we can never have justice. We can never have land reform. I'm going to make it clear, as I said in the beginning, land reform is important. If your land was taken from you, you are deserving of compensation. And it's important that the state caters for that. Um, you might think as well that people were deprived of access to land because of apartheid, not just that land was taken from them, but they were deprived of opportunities. And that's why you want other kinds of uh, redistributive measures, that you want people to the state field to buy land so people can be housed, that RDP housing plays an important role. Now, does the Constitution impede this? Well, not at all. In fact, what the Constitution is, is this incredible roadmap for how you deal with these different conflicting issues, how you deal with people that own property, um, how you deal with the landless, and to try and find some sort of just outcome. So this is the relevant section of Section 25 of our Constitution, being the Property Clause section. 
And this deals with how compensation is dealt with. It says, the amount of compensation and the time and manner of payment must be just and equitable, reflecting an equitable balance between the public interest and the interests of those affected having regard to all relevant circumstances, including the current use of the property, the history of the acquisition and use of the property, the market value of the property, the extent of direct state investment and subsidy in the acquisition and beneficial capital improvement of the property, and the purpose of the expropriation. All right, so a lot of stuff to listen to. I'm going to try and unpack it for you and make it simple. First things first. The Constitution provides for expropriation. Okay. Now, expropriation is a bit of a terrifying word, um, especially when accompanied with outcompensation. But all states expropriate. Uh, they have to. So if we think about the Gautrain project, uh, in order to build that system, you have to go through private land. So what do you do? You approach owners and say, I'd like to buy your land. If they refuse, you then expropriate and you pay them according to this method. The first thing that our courts say that you do is you go, what's the market value of the land? Okay. Um, and then we can adjust up or down based on the other factors. So, for example, we can say, well, what's the historical acquisition? How did you acquire this land? If, as people are fond of saying, that the land was acquired at the barrel of a gun, and I mean that genuinely, not in the metaphorical sense. In other words, the person who owns this land stole it. They are direct thieves. Okay. This is going to give you a very good reason to say you get paid nothing. This is what the Germans have done. So... Nazis who are in possession of stolen items were not paid compensation um, when they were handed back to beneficiaries. Okay? And justly so. They said, you're a thief. Why should you get any entitlement? However, if you're a good faith um, possessor in title, you know, four generations down the line, maybe you have some small portion of this property which was once stolen, uh, that you played no role in the theft, well then we have very good reasons to pay you compensation because you're innocent. Um, so the other thing we can look at is to say, well, hold on a sec, did you get any state subsidy to acquire this land or to develop this land? Well, if so, we can set it off. So we can say, you know, you have this farm, uh, but the government uh, gave you uh, a couple of million rand so that you could start this farm. And uh, it's only worth a couple of million rand. So we can, we can set each other off. And so you could have an instance um, where zero compensation is payable. But the general principle is going to be that um, once you've assessed the factors, um, it's going to be just and equitable in most circumstances to pay compensation. So, given that we have this threat, given that we have um, an ANC government in alliance with the EFF that are hell-bent on changing our constitution, that want to uh, alter the Bill of Rights for the first time in South Africa's history. So our constitution has been amended 17 times. And if you go and look at those amendments, none of them are to the Bill of Rights, and they're all to rather technical things. So. Uh, provincial boundaries, uh, whether we have floor crossing or not. Uh, nothing as sacred as our Bill of Rights. So we're heading into new territory here. You know, the idea that there's this full frontal attack to the most sacred portion of our most sacred document, the Constitution. And it's times like this that we need to rely on inspiration from those that have come before us. Winston Churchill says, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I can say it is to wage war by sea, land and air, with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us, to wage war against the monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be, for without victory there is no survival. Now Churchill sets out a war to be, to be waged on land, sea and air. I'm going to tell you about a different kind of war. First is in the press. We have a ill-informed, very left-leaning press. Uh, many of whom have said, um, Expropriation of our compensation is a wonderful idea. We need to do this. It's what's uh, it's required to rectify the injustice of the past, and let's just get on with it. We have a very small number of voices that have pointed out why the policy is a terrible policy, not just for wealthy people sitting in this room, but for the poorest of the poor. Uh, it's important that people write, that they express their views, and they deal with some of the information that I've given you today. So I wrote an article for the Sunday Times called Six Myths About Land Reform, where I've iterated some of what I've told you today. It's important that you're persuasive, that you're pithy, that you're able to express these ideas in a manner that is understandable, that you support those journalists that do write on it, 
And unfortunately, not all of those journalists are in the mainstream press. So we do have wonderful people like uh, Ramon and Jonathan at the Renegade Report, who've dedicated hours and hours of their podcast to talk about this important issue. They've had, had on excellent people like Franz Grenier, like Ernst Rutz, talking about the dangers of expropriation without compensation. Um, so if you don't uh, have the platform of a newspaper, you, know, you can be innovative like Martin did, and you can start your own newspaper. You know, the Rational Standard, it's an unbelievable achievement what Martin has done. You know, a couple of guys in their early 20s, uh, ignited by the Fees Must Fall movement to say, hold on a second, we're seeing our campus as a light, this isn't okay, uh, have managed to corral in so many sensible voices, and they've done an excellent job on this issue as well. So there are people out there who are dedicating their time for free, um, like Martin, like the Renegade Report guys, um, like someone like Gareth Clifford Cliff Central who hosts the Renegade Report. You know, they've done an important job of expressing these ideas. So if you have the ability to write, write. Uh, if you have the ability to do other kinds of things, like appearing on TV or appearing on radio, do it. Express the ideas in the press. Next, fight's got to be at the polls. Now, these are the parties that oppose expropriation and compensation. Okay. Uh, not all of them are doing it as loudly as they could, but we do know that when Parliament took a vote to say we are going to amend the Constitution, okay, these are the parties that voted against it. At the moment, the way that vote goes is it was 69.6% .6 of parliamentarians. Okay. So basically you have an alliance with ANC, the EFF, I think Achano in there, uh, and the AIC. Um, if any of you thought that uh, Achang and Mampela and Pele were going to do wonderful liberal things, well, you were wrong. Um, so these are the guys that on this issue have really played an important role. And I have to say, um, while the DA has been a lot quieter than they could have been on this issue, um, really they've sort of you know, cowered in the corner, um, the other parties have done a much better job in some ways. So someone like Monsieur Lakota stood in front of his former colleagues in the ANC and he said, when the president says that we are going to take back the land for our people, he said, who are our people exactly? I thought South Africa was a land for all who live in it. That's what it says in our constitution. That's what it says in the Freedom Charter. Who is this us and them? And when he said that, he was heckled uh, and abused. And he stood and he's kept up this promise to say, our constitution is sacred. I will not allow property rights to be taken away. Deserving of your vote. Um, the ACDP have also played an important role as much as I disagree with them on uh, some of their religious values, um, they've played an important role on this committee. Um, you know, they have valiantly fought for um, property rights protections, um, as have the Freyets Front um, and the IFP as well. So it's important to acknowledge that some parties have played a role. And given that I've told you how narrow that difference is, that 69.6%, why that number matters, as I'm going to show you, the Constitution says if you want to make a change to Chapter 2 of the Constitution, you need two-thirds. Now, in the next election, if some of these parties eat into that vote, by 4%, they don't have enough votes to pass through the Constitutional Amendment. So, uh, as much as you might want to hold your nose to vote for some of these guys, at least they're doing something on this core issue. So that's the fight of the polls. The next fight is in the courts. This is if um, we're faced with, with a law which, which aims to change our constitution. We have to then turn to the highest court in the land, the Constitutional Court. Now, we can have an idea of what challenge we're facing us by looking at the expropriation bill. But I will say this, first of all, which is that we have no language at the moment as to what the, the plan is to change the constitutional text. So we have a, a promise of what they intend on doing, but there is no bill before us. Um, so we're sitting in limbo before the elections. But the expropriation bill may give us some hints. So this new bill, which is not a law, um, acts or laws, bills or sort of proposals, um, sets out when you could expropriate without paying compensation. Now it says it may be just and equitable for no compensation to be paid where land is expropriated in the public interest in regard to these circumstances, but not limited to. In other words, there could be additional ones. All right. First one is where the land is occupied or used by a labor tenant. So technical definition, um, it's often going to be people that are farm laborers uh, on land. Um, there's an immediate unforeseen consequence here, which is that if you're a farmer 
who's got labor tenants who've been on your land for generations, okay, uh, who have some level of security of tenure, you know, um, uh, comfort of, of a job, um, but you don't want to lose that land and be paid nothing, you have every reason in the world to remove them from your land now before this happens. Um, so something like this with good intentions, which is we're going to expropriate the land without compensation, please note it doesn't say to give it to the laborers. In all likelihood, it'll just be seized by the state um, so that those people can be serfs to the state. Um, so if you're a farmer right now, you have every reason in the world to sue, just bring in the red ants, kick those people off your land, have a fight about whether your eviction was unlawful, but ensure that your land is now protected from expropriation or compensation. Second one, where the land is held for purely speculative purposes. I'm going to show you something quickly. So some of you may recognize this as uh, a spot of land in Midran. This is Waterfall Estate. Okay. Now you can see it's been heavily developed, um, but this is a very recent thing. So this land was vacant um, for more than 70 years. It was owned by the Mia family. Um, it's a massive tract of land worth billions. Um, now, they didn't develop it. Why not? Because they hoped it would be worth some money someday. And they decided to see what would, uh, what would develop. So you had you know, a growing Pretoria and a growing Joburg, and suddenly Midrand becomes desirable. So they speculated. Um, and if this piece of legislation was in force, they would have had that land seized by the state, and they would have been paid nothing. And that just seems incredibly unjust to me. The other ones are less worrisome. So where the land is owned by a state-owned corporation or other state-owned entity. Great. ESCOM owns a whole bunch of stuff, and the state wants to take it and redistribute it. Go for it. Um, where the land has been abandoned. Our common law tradition says land that's abandoned has no, you know, there's no owner behind the thing. Okay. So there's no one being deprived of a right. And the last one, where the market value of the land is equivalent to or less than the present value of direct state investment or subsidy and acquisition and capitalization of the land. Again, we gave you a million bucks so you could buy this land. It's worth a million bucks, so we're taking it. We're just going to do a set-off. That doesn't seem like a problem to me. But bear this in mind, this purely speculative purposes, this is, this is dangerous because, as you'll see, this all refers to land, um, but the principle is a difficult one. So some of you are going to be sitting with some excess money in your bank accounts. What's it doing there? It's sitting, speculating, wondering where it should go. Um, you know, maybe I'll buy some property, maybe I'll put it overseas, maybe I'll buy a car, maybe I'll invest in the market. I don't know, I'm speculating. So there's nothing wrong with speculating. Um, you know, the, it's, it's, it provides people an opportunity to assess their risks, to work out where they're going to make the most profit. Um, why did you buy your house? Part of it was because you thought, well, I hope it's worth some more money when I die or, you know, when I want to move. Um, you were speculating. Nothing sinister about speculation. All right, so what has this constitutional, court review, this constitutional Review Committee decided? Well, after a very long process. So what they did was they did a roadshow around the country, um, which uh, the EFF, again, I have to hand it to these guys, very good at playing politics. Um, they made an enormous effort to bus in members who would be there, who would be loud and vocal and would say, we want the land back, uh, land or death. Um, and so they arrived at these meetings and they uh, kicked up a fuss. You know, you never really had any deliberation because people were capped at a few minutes. Um, but they made sure their members were there and they created this impression, this circus of there's a hunger for land. So they did the roadshow, which as I say is uh, largely a theatrical sham. And then they had to consider some actual deliberations, which they did in Parliament. And they received an enormous number of submissions, um, hundreds of thousands of submissions. And what's amazing about these submissions is that 65% of those submissions say, don't do it. Don't change the Constitution. Uh, and they go into a range of detailed reasons why. I presented a submission on behalf of the Johannesburg Attorney Association. Um, it's available online. You can watch a number of the submissions um, on YouTube. Um, and you can see why it's such a bad idea and how many intelligent people think it's such a bad idea. Nevertheless, the Constitutional Review Committee said, we're going to do it. So. Here's the language that's important. They say, Section 25 of the Constitution must be amended to make explicit that which is implicit in the Constitution with regards to expropriation of land without compensation as a legitimate option for land reform, so as to address the historic wrongs caused by the arbitrary disposition of land and in so doing ensure equitable access to land and further empower the majority of South Africans to be productive participants in ownership, food security, and agricultural reform programs. Next, that Parliament must urgently establish a mechanism to effect the necessary amendment to the relevant um, part of Section 25 of the Constitution 
and this must all be done before the next election. Now, I think some of them have conceded that they don't have the time, that they can't ram this through. You'll see that what they have to do is, this doesn't tell you what changes they want to make. It says, well, we've got to get another committee to decide what those changes are going to be. So you'll have the Justice Committee, which will then deliberate um, on some language. Um, there's an argument that that language is limited in scope in a couple of ways. Firstly, Section 25 deals with property. Land is a subclass of property, which means they cannot affect any of the rights that you have regarding property. Um, they can only affect the subclass being land. Okay. The next is they say to make explicit that which is implicit. Vague. What does this mean? Well, on the one hand, it could mean nothing. Uh, in other words, you can only do that which is already there. Um, we can only explicate those things that are implicit in the text. Now, as I've said, um, and it's a sort of popular view uh, among some academics, that the Constitution already allows for expropriation of the compensation. It does, in some narrow cases. So in an instance where your property has no market value, or where the state's you know, given you a loan, uh, or where you stole the land, in those cases, there's no, there's no compensation required. But you've got the big 100 million rand uh, wine farm, okay, which you didn't steal. The state gave you no money to set up. It's made from your own hard efforts. Well, under the current constitution, they've got to pay you. Um, and so one of the big challenges will be, in other words, if that, if that legislation um, amending the constitution goes beyond any of the meaning that we have in our current constitution, that's an immediate room for attack. To say, hold on a second, this committee only gave Parliament a very narrow mandate, and Parliament has extended beyond that. Okay, so I've mentioned to you that there are these different thresholds for changing the Constitution. First is if you want to change Section 1 of our Constitution, you need 75%. So this is seen as the fundamental portion of the Constitution. And Martin has really written phenomenally well on this topic. I'm going to touch on it briefly, um, but... Uh, it's well worth reading some of Martin's work on how the rule of law can play a role in protecting our Constitution. The second is that you need two-thirds to change the Bill of Rights. So let's have a quick look at Section 1. Um, so is that these are these foundational values for South Africa. So human dignity, achievement of equality, advancement of rights and freedoms, non-racialism and non-sexism. So on that non-racialism front, um, this idea that we can seize land um, owned by people of a particular race and give it to people of another race, well, Section 1 says, not on your life. Um, this is a country founded on the value of non-racialism. We've been down that path before. We've imposed uh, heavy racialized legislation to ensure that some people could not be owners, that they could not live in certain areas. Um, and that's why our constitutional forefathers said, lest we forget, that's not happening. Um, and so if... Um, they want to do anything on that basis, they would have to change that non-racialism clause. Okay, this is the bit that Martin's written very well about, which is supremacy of the Constitution and the rule of law. Here the idea is that the rule of law is not just about application of the law, um, it is about certain substantive values, and that one of those values is the right to private property. Um, that it's embedded in it, so people think of life, liberty, and property as being embedded in the rule of law, and so the argument is that if you intrude on property rights, you're really intruding on the rule of law, and you cannot do that unless you can get 75% of parliamentarians to agree to it. Okay. There's another kind of challenge that can be done. Um, now, it's novel because, as I say, we've never interfered in the Bill of Rights before. This is Section 36 of our Constitution, okay? And really what it is is it governs when the state can limit any of, your fund, any of the rights in the Bill of Rights. It says they can only be limited in terms of a law of general application, Okay? which means, in other words, you can't just have some uh, dignitary saying, I'm doing it. Okay? You have to pass a statute. Okay? To the extent the limitation is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society. Now, that phrase, open and democratic society, what our courts have done before is to say, well, what do other democratic societies do? And we're trying to work out what is reasonable. Um, we know that um, countries around the world have expropriation regimes and that international law deals with what you need to do when you expropriate. And the test in international law is that you pay prompt and adequate compensation. Okay. It's definitely not zero. Um, prompt and adequate is how we cash out just and equitable in our constitution. So it's democratic societies based on human dignity, equality, and freedom, and then you take into account these other factors. 
So first of all, you look at the nature of the right. You're dealing with a fundamental right, the right to property. Okay? Now, what's the importance of the purpose of the limitation? Well, presumably it's land reform. It's to provide people with more access to houses. What's the extent of that limitation? It is dramatic because you are confiscating um, land that is owned by someone and you're paying them nothing. You are stealing from them. It is as dramatic a limitation as you could have. Um, now, is there a limitation, is there a relationship between the limitation and its purpose? Well, as I've said, if what you're trying to do is assist the vulnerable, well, you're going to do the exact opposite because you're going to wreck the economy. Um, you're going to have huge instability. So all those people that you, know, you want to try and assist are not going to be assisted. They're going to be destroyed. Are there less restrictive means to achieve the purpose? Yes, we've been doing them. Um, we have compensated 1.8 million individuals for land that was taken from them. We can continue to have a just, fair judicial process to determine that. We can allocate more than 0.3% of the budget. So the use of this section is to say, look, even if Parliament gets the numbers, let's say they, 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 they continue, voters don't turn out, the ANC and the FF get their, uh, get their higher threshold, they're sitting at 69% together, and they say, we're doing it, we're passing this bill. Well, this is the protection in the Constitution. This is the, the force field that says you can only do that. You can only limit the rights in the Bill of Rights if you meet these other tests. And so I think this is going to play an enormous role in litigation that goes forward. When the challenges come, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about those that are going to be bringing these challenges, these are the organizations that have stood up, that have said, this is a fight worth fighting. Um, we are going to put our intellectual resources, our financial resources, uh, into writing about this, into engaging litigation. Uh, they have played an enormous role. So we've got the Helen Susan Foundation, AfriForum, Saka Licha, which had an incredible conference on this topic. They managed to get all of the big stakeholders together, all of the opposition parties that uh, at least are united on this question to protect our constitution. They got them together. They got and a, a number of civil society organizations together. They've produced excellent press statements. Um, they are playing an enormous role in fighting this fight. Institute for Race Relations has made this a big issue. Uh, they are producing wonderful media content. You've got someone like Sikhle and Kobesi touring the country, telling people why expropriation without compensation is not going to help anyone. It's going to be bad for the poor, be bad for the nation. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the Johannesburg Tony Association has played quite an important role in saying that the Constitution matters, the rule of law matters, and we're going to protect it. And finally, of course, the Free Market Foundation, which has held its own conferences, has produced a number of articles on the topic, uh, and has brought all of you here together today. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to answer as many questions as you like. Yes. When the time is up, I guess. Sure. Yes, first. Go for it. Congratulations on an excellent presentation. It's put it into such definitive thing that I think we can all take away and work on. That's first of all. I was here at the um, presentation that was by um, Alex on EWC. But I, I believe it, it should be repeated here. I'm a Baku resident and a very powerful ANC politician started on the public uh, WhatsApp site and asked for my address. And he asked, I, people were asking why you want it. He said because Jim's address is going to be top of the expropriation list for the clue. And he said, if he resists, he will personally pepper spray me, put me in handcuffs, and throw me into jail. Now, my perception of that is that's a general thought that's happening within the ANC party. And that's why it's so important that everybody takes this away and works on it and gives it to everybody else. And the question I've got is, will you give your presentation out? Yes, without a doubt. So as I say, uh, the purpose of doing what I'm doing today is to get these ideas out into the world. Um, you know, it's not just those of you in this room, it's those of you watching uh, on the live stream on Facebook, those of you that are going to watch later on YouTube. Um, 
I'm happy to make this presentation available to anyone that wants it. Uh, there are longer, more substantive documents. There's articles. There's uh, the submissions to Parliament. Um, all of it is uh, freely available. Uh, it's one of the things I'm happy to do pro bono for you. Yes? Part to your presentation, um, I believe that Section 4 holds a lot of <coughs> prospect for the rule of law because <coughs> Dicey, who was one of the original authors of the rule of law, mentioned specifically property as being protected as part of the concept of the rule of law. So I would I think a court of law would think twice before uh, saying it's not. In other words, by an international convention and the, and the writers on the rule of law. The second issue which you didn't mention is international treaties. South Africa is a member of various international treaties, including the United Nations Human Rights, which, which specifically, again, talks about property rights. So there's a lot of scope in that to argue the international <coughs> treaty side. There is. So, um, specifically on international law, we did... Not only the UNO one. There are quite a lot of others, too. Yes. Um, the Joe Wigton Association did uh, multiple submissions. So, we wrote a, a short one, which is sort of pretty similar to what I've told you about tonight, uh, then presented in person. And we spoke, I spoke to the public quite a bit about international law. And this problem of South Africa being rendered a pariah state if they act out of accordance with international law. And on that basis, they invited us to write something longer and more substantive. So there's a, about a 30-page submission um, on the international law implications, having a look at you know, what treaties you signed up to, what implications it has. Our Constitution specifically recognizes international law as well. It says that you must consider it when interpreting the Constitution. So yeah, that's an important thing. Um, good evening. Um, what I'm wondering, if I, when we looked at the slide about the expropriation bill. Um, they specifically mentioned, I can't remember the exact wording, but uh, equi equitable land distribution reform. Not sure what the exact wording is, but what do they mean by both equitable and land? And will it simply stay at land or will it um, expand, as I've talked to some of the people here tonight, or will it expand from land to property in general? Um, just to think what are your thoughts on that? So, look, the, the original move to change the Constitution, you know, when the Constitutional Review Committee was tasked with um, touring the country and bringing in written submissions, they narrowed it. So they originally said expropriation of land without compensation. Now, I don't know if it was because they were clumsy, but I certainly seized on it and made a big point of it in my presentation to say, you cannot do anything beyond land because of the question that you have put before yourselves. You've asked the public to comment on this narrow question, not property. Now, the problem, of course, is, in other words, so I say they can't uh, affect other property rights. But they do certainly set a very dangerous precedent, um, which is that if you're willing to affect something like land, which is so fundamental, well, what's to stop them you know, attacking your shares um, or you know, your private bank account or your car or whatever else it is, your intellectual property? There's another problem as well, which is what accedes to your land. So if your house is built on it and cannot be moved um, and they expropriate the land, can they say, well, the land includes your house? Or do they say, well, we'll you know, we're taking the land for free, but we'll pay you for the, the building. Um, that'll be something that will be decided by the courts. Uh, equitable, as you point out, it's a kind of weasel word. Um, you know, it's, uh, it depends. Um, you know, it's sort of what's fair in the circumstances. Um, typically, lawyers talk about the difference between courts of justice and courts of equity. Uh, courts of equity, you know, tend to be well. I kind of feel like, yeah. So just a very um, just, 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 just the final thing because that I forgot to mention. Who will be getting the land once it's been been taken? Yeah. Will it just lay in the? Um, sorry about this. Uh, will it just be in the hands of the government, or will they just give it to whoever asks? Who will be getting the land at the end of the day? So yeah, it's an important question. Um, we can have a look at the state's behavior in the past, which is that uh, the state doesn't like poor people owning property. Um, so Leon has really led the way um, in this with the Kyle Lund project, saying that people that have been living on land for a very long period of time but have no title to that land um, are being treated like serfs, uh, and they should be given title to that land. We know that what the state likes to do is to act as custodian 
um, to say that, you know, we as your heavenly Father will take the land for us and we'll bestow it upon you as we deem fit, basically to our cadres, to those that vote for us. Um, Karen Morn um, produced an article a couple of days ago talking about what's happened uh, in some recent land development projects. Um, there are 43 officials who are um, you know, facing uh, criminal charges because they've been avoid, uh, involved in fraudulent schemes. Um, so even when you've got a compensation system in place, you obviously have a bunch of hungry officials who are going to defraud it. Can you imagine how dangerous it is going to be when you, know, you can settle your pet petty grievances by saying, well, as the state, we're going to take that uh, and pay you nothing for it and hand it to our mates. You know, um, you know, you just open yourselves up to all sorts of abuses. Um, David. Thanks, Mark. I was wondering, could you go back to the slide with um, section 12.3? Um, and it's to the gentleman's point there, and I think it's just worth reviewing it because there's a, there's a phrase there that says, so it lists those, those five criteria, that it says including but not limited to. Yes. So, I mean, surely that leaves open quite a lot of uncertainty, right? I mean, if they wanted to include other conditions, then surely they should have just included that in the legislation. I mean, do you think that that is potentially, uh, you know, something that could be exploited by would-be expropriators who... David, you don't have enough faith in the state. <laughs> <laughs> we can trust <laughs> the administrators who will look at this and apply their minds fairly, you know. How dare you imply they wouldn't? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, this is an exact example of the difference between arbitrary power and the rule of law. Okay. The rule of law means you need to enumerate exactly what your legal powers are. You can tell me I can do A, B, C, and D. And if you say, and whatever the hell else I feel like, that's not the rule of law. That's arbitrary rule. That's the rule of men. And by saying stuff like, but not limited to, you're doing exactly that. So there's a very good rule of law challenge to this. Thank you for pointing it out. Uh, Sebastian. Mark, you did refer to the obstinate brick of South African exceptionalism and the belief that it's quite prevalent, which s strikes me quite a bit that, um, uh, of certain parallels with alcoholics who don't believe that they have an issue. And, the, and they are in, in denial of it. How easy or difficult would you say would it be to push the message or to get a broader audience to understand that perhaps actually South Africa is not that exceptional, that perhaps it trails what a lot of other African countries have done, that the governing party has acquired power because they're good at fomenting uh, revolutions, but when things become not so good, when somebody has to keep the lights on and prevent children from dying in pit latrines, then uh, a certain level of skill comes that is not necessarily present. And uh, typically the regime then realizes its own inadequacies and becomes more authoritarian. You know, that's when it starts hurting people and taking their stuff. You know, how um, difficult or easy would you say would be to get uh, a broader audience to understand that, no, this is, not ex uh, this is not an exception. And essentially you have a classical scenario of, liberating, of liberators turning tyrants. And much as you had the need to be li liberated from colonialism, now you have a need to be liberated from the, li the liberators. Mm. So a couple of things on, I suppose, the art of persuasion. Um, I think a lot of nations feel that they have a unique special story to tell. You know? They're like a, like a bunch of millennial children that have been told, you know, you're just a wonderful little snowflake. Uh, you know, the Americans think that they have a unique special story to tell. Um, and, you know, they're sort of having their own interesting constitutional crises going, well, it was a gentlemanly way of behaving when you were the president until suddenly your president's not a gentleman anymore and he can do what he likes. Um, so it's important to recognize that institutions matter, um, that those institutional structures which have been built up for generations play an important role. Um, I think what's difficult is that it's hard to persuade people um, with stats. So I've done a little bit of that tonight. I've given you some ideas of numbers. Um, I think what you need are good stories to tell. Um, and I think that's why I try and you know, pep my anecdotes with, with a range of different responses. So you know, if you can visualize what it's like to be you know, standing in a, an hours long queue at the supermarket so that you can get your toilet paper or you can get your fuel, um, you know, that gives you a vivid idea of what you can face. Right? Um, I, I also have a, a motto that's worth living by which is, no matter how bad things get, they can always get worse. Okay? We have this awful optimism built into us that we say, 
well, it's gotten so bad, it has to get better. No, it doesn't. It can get terrible. Uh, other countries have shown us how bad things can get. Things were really terrible uh, in Zim a couple of months ago, and they've just gotten worse. They cut their internet off, uh, you know, people are being shot. Uh, in, in Venezuela, as I said, the inflation rate went from uh, astoundingly terrible to absolutely utterly terrible. Things can get worse, so don't get complacent. Yes? Thanks very much, Mark. Thanks for the presentation. Um, as a, a DA member of Parliament, we may disagree on, on whether we've been carrying in the corner or not. I think that DA stands up for constitutionalism is not a headline. Terror stands up and attacks his ex-colleagues is a headline, so your left-leaning press may, may tend to focus more on that. But just a couple of things I want to I, I, I want to uh, bring out now. Um, specifically, I think I want to add two strings to your bow in terms of the uh, fighting them on the the beaches and the air, etc., etc. Mm. So th the two issues, and I really want to put out a call call to action here. Um, the one is to write in your comments on expropriation bill that has been put forward up for public comment. Um, Ladies and gents, it's important that we get as many comments in on that uh, as we got in on the constitutional amendment. And the reason is that the, um, the ANC is aware, and you, you've mentioned the text of the constitutional amendment. The ANC is aware that they're not going to necessarily get the backing of the EFF on the wording. So that's where they possibly stand to lose their 66%. In order, however, to deliver on their 50, uh, on, on the their, their mandate uh, from their Congress, um, they're going to need to bring the bill through, which is why it's been introduced. It's been introduced uh, kind of in a hurry. And what they've done is they've taken the previous expropriation bill, made a few tiny little amendments, including that section 12.3 that, that, that you put up for us, which specifically brings in uh, expropriation without compensation. This is to deliver on their mandate that their people gave them. So um, remember, for a bill, they only need a 50% majority instead of the 66 so they can effectively push that through right now as it stands uh, with, with their membership. So the issue is, folks, please put your, put your ideas forward in writing. It's important. There's a lot of holes in that bill. And a couple of things that I want to mention as well um, is that, first of all, property is not limited to land. It says so in Section 25 of the Constitution. Um, and then in this expropriation bill, it refers to uh, intangible and movable property as well. So that includes your um, ideas for apps, your, your intellectual property. It includes your bank account that you were talking about uh, keeping as well. Okay? And it includes your cattle and your cars, etc., etc. So any property can be expropriated in terms, of, in terms of the Constitution as it stands right now. But now without compensation, which is, which is the worrying bit. So folks, please get your submissions in on this, on, on this draft bill because um, it, it, it's scary and it looks like it's something that is going to get pushed. The other thing that I want to push is the education point of view. Um, getting out and speaking and, as you said, writing about it. Now, now something that not many people have read is the high-level panel report uh, that was put together by Khalima Motlante and team. Okay? And effectively, it's an ANC document. I mean, Khalima Motlante is the ex-ANC president. Um, on page 50 of, this, of, of the, um, the executive summary of this, I'm not going to bore you by reading it, but I urge you all to go and Google it, go and get a copy and read, if nothing else, page 50 of this, where it says all of the things that you've mentioned. It talks about the um, uh, corruption amongst the, um, uh, the staff within the department that is impeding land reform. It talks about the fact that the need to pay expropriation is not the biggest hindrance, etc., etc. If you can get that message out to people through whatever means you can, like you say, write, talk, phone into the radio, etc., etc., get those messages out. The ANC is not even got united on this thing. Um, last two points, if I may. Number one, you mentioned that of the various items that are up there in front of us, uh, CD and E were less worrisome. Um, the problem I have is that land uh, that has been abandoned has not been defined at all, anywhere. So abandoned land in terms of the bill is a big problem, uh, certainly for us, because, you know, if I go away on holiday, have I abandoned my land is, is, is the one question. <laughs> it might be technical, but I mean, you know, as you say, trust the state, go for it. <laughs> okay. The other one is the issue around state-owned property. And this is a massive concern because of the fact that there are large game reserves, there are large protected areas. There's also large uh, pieces of land owned by certain departments, such as the Department of Defense, okay, that have a massive value. You have places like Eskom, 
who have taken out bonds or loans through from other countries, okay? And those other countries have in the past shown a tendency to be willing to accept when you can't pay to accept tracts of land. And this movement of land in terms of that is something that we're very concerned mm -hmm. about as well. So it's something I just want to highlight and throw it out there. This is an exchange of ideas. But yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I've certainly taken a lot out of it and I'll take it further up as well. Thank you, Mark. Excellent. Thanks so much for that. Uh, yeah, no, I do appreciate the technical comments. I think it is well worth, the way to read legislation is skeptically, to think what's the worst case scenario. Uh, so as I say, the common law understanding of abandoned land is quite strenuous but you could have it uh, defined in the bill in a less strenuous way. Um, you definitely don't want your house being taken over while you're on vacation. Um, I will say this, in its current form, uh, this section is unconstitutional. Um, it clearly um, allows for compensation to be withheld in cases where the, the, the current constitution says you've got to pay. Um, so if this thing were passed under a current constitutional regime, uh, it wouldn't pass constitutional muster. Um, which also means that if that's the current state of affairs, and if you look at the beginning of this bill, it starts off by saying, acting in terms of Section 25 of the Constitution, in other words, they recognize that, that is the prevailing law, um, well then, it should be for tooth and nail now. Um, and I hope the DA is doing a good job of fighting that, and everyone here should be doing a job in you know, writing in submissions um, or funding those organizations that do. So, you know, the last slide that I have in my presentation is all those organizations who've played a role in uh, you know, fighting for our rights. Um, and, uh, you know, they don't just do it for free. Um, so there's a lot to be said for um, expropriating some of your personal property and handing it over with our conversation with these guys. Uh, yes, some more questions. Uh, in the back, that's been there for a while. Thanks very much. There seems to be many options in terms of the path to the finality of this whole process. Could you perhaps set out what those steps could be? Because you're saying the expropriation bill could go to a constitutional challenge. The wording could go to a constitutional challenge. And what I'm looking at is what is the likely timeline on this? How long is a piece of string probably? But if one starts to look at the impact of this whole exercise in terms of investment and development and property, particularly in South Africa, it could have long-term serious consequences. And if one can get a feel, is it going to be a one-year, a 20-year issue? I think it's important to understand that. Yeah, as you point out, um if you're an investor who's got some excess bucks and you're thinking, well, I could put it in a country in Eastern Europe where there's going to be the promise of, of growth of my capital, a place like Poland, um, or I can put it in South Africa um, where they very well may take um, the land that I invested in. Hmm, I wonder what I'm going to do. Uh, so you just have a whole bunch of institutions that are just not investing. They're sitting with cash in the bank um, waiting for an outcome. And so all that investor uncertainty is highly detrimental. Uh, it would be very useful if we could resolve this issue quickly. Um, Aram Pauza, um, by the way, who I'm sure s at least some of you in the room think he's a good guy. He's got our interest at heart. He's the businessman fighting the good fight against the evil thugs in his own party. Well, just remind yourself of a few things. One of the first things President Ramaphosa said uh, when he was elected president of the ANC was, we are going to expropriate without compensation. And he has said it over and over and over again. I take this crazy view, which Gareth Monson shares, which is when politicians say things, I believe them. <laughs> no, it's laughable. Um, so, yeah, so we've got someone who seems hell-bent on doing this uh, with utter disregard for the effect it's going to have on the economy and with no sense of timescale. So, as you say, like, are we looking at six months? Are we looking at 20 years? We don't know. Um, probably because there's internal divisions in the party. So, for example... Uh, that declaration from the Constitutional Review Committee says, we're going to do this before the next elections. And then a few days later they said, oh, no, we don't think we can pull that off. So who knows. Um, if they get roundly defeated in this set of elections, which uh, if the DA were doing a better job in the polls, which they're not, uh, they're sitting at 18%. It looks like for the first time ever they're going to lose votes. I wish you guys were doing better. I wish you could fight this issue. You know, Tony Leon said, if he was still leader of the party, there would be a billboard uh, hanging from every bridge that says expropriation without compensation over my dead body. Okay. Can any of you guys think of a DA um, billboard that says that? I hope they come out in the next election because really, you know, there are some liberals in your party who care about these values uh, and there are people who don't. Um, yes, uh, you have a response. Mark, you raised um, the legalistic 
counters that could be raised to expropriation, which I should also say is theft. Um, so, um, but the problem is that if the, this ANC regime decides to play by Africa rules, they'll just do exactly the same as the market did, and I've suspended the Constitution or ignore it. And certainly the police and the military are not going to come to the rescue of the balance of the population. Yeah, that's a concern. Uh, I will say this, which is that, um, astoundingly so, uh, the state still largely complies with court orders and still takes the rule of law seriously to an extent. There's a point in time where that may no longer happen. Um, and as you say, that's when you have serious problems uh, because then you have a, you know, a police force and an army that's not going to protect its citizens but will protect those that are in power, right? Uh, and whoever they favor, as we've seen in Zim and Venezuela. Um, I, I don't think we're there yet, um, but it's always worth bearing that worst scenario in mind. Uh, yes? So, I, I was thinking, you mentioned that, in, I think it was in the, nor in the northern, northern Cape, that there were farms that were expropriated, land was taken, and then um, there was just a small portion of those farms that remained effective. Uh, what was that number again? It's uh, Eastern Cape, um, and it's 26 oh, farms Cape. out of 264. Okay, so Eastern Cape, and it's a small number. Um, what happened to those those people? Because it feels it feels like this this constitution is a forgery. Uh, uh, it forges exiles, and not only ex exiles in terms of people, but in terms of their stuff. Because what happens to the agricultural equipment, for instance? What happens to the money? Where does it go? You know, does it go to the cloud in heaven and play a harp? Like what 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 happens? And that, that's something I'm wondering about because it's not only as far as it goes, you know, it's not only like, oh, will, will this happen in 20 years? It's what will the depth of the effect be within within a year, within two years? How deep will it go? Because with our very, um, I want to say, uh, interesting African rhetoric that we have over here, I, I think things go, go, it's quite fast paced and things get pushed under the rug very quickly. So I, I, I want to ask you, what do you know what, what would happen? Like how, how far such an exile, sorry for phrasing it like that, but that's the only word I can think of. How deep and how far would you, do you think something like that would go? Would it be Zimbabwe, would it be Venezuela, would it be a mix? Would it be communist Russia or, or North Korea, you know? As you say, the slide can happen very quickly. You know, I mean, socialists have only been in power in Zim for 20 years. Um, and they have done an astoundingly quick job. It's the one thing socialists are, are you know, good at doing quickly is ruining an economy. Uh, they're not good at doing much else quickly. Um, so yeah, things could go, could go south quickly. Um, as you point out, I mean, when you have 90% of your farms failing, what happens to the guys who are working on those farms? Well, they're unemployed, right? Yeah. So it's, let's say just for a moment you're saying, you know what, those farmers, you know, bunch of landlords, capitalist pigs, you know, I don't care about them. But if you care about the poor peasants who are working that land and had been for generations, well, they're not unemployed. Uh, and probably unemployable because the agricultural sector is being hit very hard. If you see the polls saying that most people are worried about, um, you know, uh, unemployment for jobs, and at the same time you have a bunch of people worried about having the land back, but then you have more people who are unemployed. It's, it's just so much ambiguity. It's it's this, but not limited to. I mean, this could go anywhere. You know, this could uh, this could give us a uh, yeah. Yeah, as you say, it's sort of, um, it's astounding how the state can pay such poor attention to priorities uh, and how they can manufacture false priorities. This is the survey that you were talking about earlier, and you can see, um, you know, land distribution is right at the bottom, 0.6%. People don't care about this thing. They really care about unemployment. You know, South Africa has an unemployment crisis. You've got like 27% of people are unemployed. Uh, if you had a growing economy, if you had... Um, encouragement for small businesses or for large businesses to, you know, to hire people if you had uh, you know, more flexible labor policies, you probably have a lot less social unrest too. You know, we've got to remember that the, the social issues we have are very much tied to the economic issues. Um, South Africa has a thousand um, service delivery process every year. It's three a day. Okay? You can see service delivery is the next big thing there at a third of people. Uh, if those guys were, were earning decent wages, uh, that would make an enormous difference. If the state was doing the things that it's supposed to be doing, you know, we wouldn't have these problems. Uh, yes? Mark, you will recall a couple of years ago, there was a Concord decision relating to the deprivation of an owner of mineral rights, of those mineral rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was held not to be expropriation, simply because the state 
um, deprived the owner of the mineral rights and took them into custody, but did not pass them on to a new owner. That would be the complete process of expropriation. And because it was not technically expropriation, the Concord, and I think the Chief Justice wrote that judgment, held that no, exprop uh, no compensation had to be paid. Is there a danger that the state could adopt the same methodology with regard to land broadly as they did with mineral rights, or is there no danger? Would you enlighten us? Sure. So I'll say this, um, which is that uh, the state saw that judgment and uh, leapt for joy and said, ah, this custodianship, this sounds very nice. Um, McQuang's reasoning in that judgment was that minerals are a special thing. They have a unique history in South Africa, that you've had um, you know, people working on mines for, for generations. Uh, there's something symbolic about these minerals trapped inside Mother Earth, and on that basis kind of created this little sub-caveat for minerals. Uh, he then went into quite a lot of detail explaining why it was a special case and wouldn't apply to all sorts of other property. But the state produced something called um, the Promotion and Protection of Investment Act. Um, it's, uh, you know, you'll, you'll notice that uh, authoritarians are very good at, uh, at covering their, their authoritarian measures with beautiful language, promoting and protecting investments. The plan was to do exactly that to everything, which was to say all property, and there was a long list, um, could be taken as custodianship, which, and under custodianship, which means no obligation to pay compensation. Um, I, at the time, wrote a number of articles on it, and did some lobbying on it, and I was at a SIA conference um, with a representative of the Minister for, it was the, it was the Department of Trade and Industry uh, that were pushing the bill forward. And at it, um, they withdrew at the conference. They said, you know what, we've realized uh, that that judgment doesn't uh, enable us to do what we think it does, and we're removing it, and they did. Um, so it seems, at least for now, that that fight has been fought and won. Uh, well, yes? Um, I would have thought that the reason for paying compensation is for the deprivation. You're replacing cash as an asset in someone's balance sheet uh, with mineral rights in, in that case. <coughs> Whether it, uh, the mineral rights are held or the land are held in custody or actually passed on to somebody else is immaterial. I think philosophically that judgment is suspect. Uh, yeah, so uh, in other countries they refer to constructive expropriation, um, which is... In other words, where the state takes something but doesn't go and hand it on to someone else, and they probably would have considered that an act of constructive expropriation and would have required payment. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, the difficulty with the Constitutional Court is, being the highest court in the land, it can decide what the law is. Yep. Uh, yes. Um, I'm just curious. Be yeah, go, go for it. I'm just curious of, the, of what's the end goal of the entire expropriation without compensation plan because as you mentioned 95% of the, um, the land claims between um, 1944, no, 1945 and 2014 has been um, dealt with A and B most of them wanted cash instead of land itself so I, I'm just wondering what what are they trying to do where where do they want to end up because I assume they want to don't want to create Zimbabwe to revenge of Marxism or something <laughs> Where, where, do you think that, where do they want to end up at the end of the day? Well, if you listen to the EFF, uh, they have a, a different idea in mind to the ANC officially, um, which is that no one should be a private owner of land, uh, that everything should be owned by the state, and that individuals should have leasehold uh, over land, uh, which is reviewable every 25 years. Um, so that is the official EFF manifest on it. So in other words, if you currently vote EFF and you think the EFF is going to give you land, well, read their manifesto. They're going to take it from you. Uh, and maybe if you behave, they'll let you lease it from them. So yeah, that's the Marxist, Marxism uh, you know, 5.7, um, because it's been tried so many times and failed every single time, no, 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 still appears to be on Marxism, the cards. That wasn't real Marxism, you see. That wasn't real Marxism. Yes. We'll do it right. They'll do it. The EFF will do it right. Yes. They'll do it properly this time. Just, you just have to believe in the state, as exactly. you said. <laughs> uh, there's a question at the back. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, Simon. Unfortunately, I missed most of your presentation. But from what I You're going to fail the pop quiz afterwards. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm definitely going to look, it up, uh, look up for it on, on the channels um, that you mentioned. Um, what I would like to know, you know, Simon, is that. Um, just today, and it's actually a historical thing the world over, is that the percentage of young people who actually go out and vote 
sign of very, very, very low. And so those between the age uh, um, so of 18 to 30 is actually the least likely to, um, to vote. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, so we sit with a problem, so you know, for them, they're not as politically loyal to a specific political party so as the, the parents or older generations would do. So for them, so I'm, I'm very similar to the table that you've got out there, for them land is very much, you know, so at a lower scale compared to things um, like unemployment and um, um, so the education, etc. So, what about, um, so what difference would it make if there's a great a greater mobilisation of actually get younger people so to take part in um, in this process? So, in order to get them mobilised, you know, so in order, so to um, so to um, provide a counterweight, so to what the politicians um, so are trying um, trying to do. Because obviously they are the ones that are going to pay the consequences so in the future, so even more than, uh, than we are. So it's their futures that are at stake. So to what extent are they actually so in, um, informed about what is going on in this case? Well, you raise an excellent issue, um, which is that we've got a very young population in South Africa who I think are quite disheartened. You know, the unemployment rate among the youth is much higher than among the general population. Um, they're easy prey for radical organizations like the EFF, uh, who've done an excellent job of mobilizing them because they say, uh, hey guys, you don't have a job. Um, would you like some free t-shirts and some KFC and come to this rally with us? Um, you know, and uh, let's take back the land. And that sounds wonderful. Um, and I do think it's important that you know, organizations that understand uh, the importance of property rights and how much that matters for the youth that they reach out to them. Um, there are a couple of excellent youngsters who are doing that. Um, and uh, you know, speaking the, the language of the youth and you know, engaging on Twitter and you know, starting uh, podcasts and video series and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's an important thing. I think the DA probably feels this difficult tension with uh, those in the DA youth, is that there probably are a lot more radical people in the DA. I mean, I, from people I speak to there, um, some members of the DA think expropriation of the compensation is a great idea uh, in, in the youth. And the party's obviously not conveying the liberal ideas property to, properly to its own members. Um, so, yeah, I think political parties have a role to play in, in convincing people and the youth that this is an important thing worth fighting, um, and getting them together to join us in this fight is vital for all of us. Uh, question over there. Yeah, I'm just coming back to, to this gentleman's uh, statement here regarding the EFF's policies. So, um, suppose uh, they get their way and the government is now going to take all of the land. How exactly does it work with things like the Ingwenyama Trust? Like, I mean, when you go down to... And of course, if you're going to go to Zululand and tell the Zulu king, well, we're going to come and take over the show here, well, then how are the courses going to feel about that? And then you have to ask, what about the Sutu Nitwana, and who's from this sort of area and region? I mean, why then? It seems like you're preferring one tribal community over another. And in South Africa, this notion of these communities is a very significant part about this course of preserving their cultures and these things. Mm. I'm just thinking what you might. How does that catch up? Yeah, so the, I think ANC is kind of equivocated on this issue. Um, you know, on the one hand, this idea that you know we're going to expropriate whatever land we need to. Um, the Zulus have made it very clear that if you touch land uh, in the Yongwe Trust, uh, that they've got their battle gear ready. Um, um, now, it's what's interesting as well is that you have this, some would say, unlikely alliance between Afri Forum and the Zulu King, saying that uh, property rights matter and we're going to protect this. Um, so you're right, and you do open up another can of worms, an ethnic can of worms, by saying, well, fine, we'll have a Zulu exemption. Uh, how's that going to go down? Um, you, know, you, you know, part of, if you look at our equality clause, you know, we don't discriminate on the grounds of ethnicity or race. Um, so you can't prioritize one group over another. Um, so, yeah, there's a very dangerous can of worms there that uh, ought not to be knocked over. Uh, yes? Is a thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, my question is more just a basic question of clarification. The reason why I'm um, asking this basic clarification question is the thing is that I've encountered many people um, and the thing is people don't know what actually is going on. It's like, no, it's in the news, no amendment, section 25, no, it's going to go through. And the, the result is just hysteria um, and just... I wouldn't say mass hysteria, not at this point, but hysteria, and then people start doing 
and saying very irresponsible things that can just make the situation way worse. So the thing is people don't know what's going on and they're not informed. So I just want to ask a basic clarification on where are we now with the expropriation bill. I know you mentioned your talks not past yet and stuff, but like what the nature of it is, how you know how it could be passed, and also you mentioned the force field. I believe that you mentioned it was section 36 or something. Just elaborate more on that, just to have a basic um, like clarification so that we can um, just communicate to people and just prevent um, unnecessary hysteria. Please. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hmm. I'm not convinced that the hysteria is unnecessary. Uh, I'm concerned about complacency. I think we are far enough down the road uh, on this thing uh, where we should be very concerned. Uh, and I'm not a fearmonger. Uh, I think you've got to be reasonable, you've got to look at the evidence, you know, you've got to weigh things up, you've got to act reasonably. Uh, and what we have is a proclamation from Parliament saying we're going we're gonna to change the Bill of Rights. Um, that's time to be alarmed. Um, when it comes to how long, we don't know. We have a limbo. As I say, we have a sense that um, the aim is to try and do it before the elections. It's unlikely that they'll be able to get it done before then, but I'm sure there'll be some mad scrambling. Um, it's also no coincidence that the expropriation bill is to be, the, the call for public comments is, you know, during December and now, you know, when people are still kind of, you know, getting back from their holidays, they're disorientated. You know, it's a very clever way to push things through, um, you know, when your populace isn't looking. Um, so that's why, you know, I am thankful for you saying earlier that the public ought to play an important role uh, in combating the expropriation bill and pointing out how pernicious and unconstitutional it is. Um, there will also be a, another process, which is that once we get this bill, which is to amend the, to amend the Bill of Rights, um, there will be another public comment on that and um, more room for engagement and people need to do that and they need to do that in a, in a reasonable manner. Um, so look, when you say hysteria, I mean, you know, you don't want people sort of you know, running through the streets with their you know, arms in the air going, what are we going to do? Um, you want them thinking about what to do, uh, taking decisive action, um, having a game plan, um, knowing how to do that. And that's what I've tried to say is that you want a good battle strategy uh, because we are engaged in the battle here. You know? uh, part of it's the battle of ideas. Part of it's a battle at the polls. Um, don't get me wrong, I know I've said a lot of mean things about the DA tonight, but uh, I hope your guys' numbers go up. Um, they're one of the parties that do care about liberal values sometimes. Um, yeah, go for it. One important aspect of this which we haven't discussed tonight is third party interests, in particular mortgages and bank mortgages. Yeah. I have my farm mortgage to Standard Bank. Where does, what happens with Standard Bank? <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this is an amazing thing to me. So I went to an event at Norton Rose, okay, in Santon. You're at literally the epicenter of white monopoly capital, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, they've got this conference on expropriation and compensation, and they have. Uh, uh, bosses there and business uh, leaderships in Africa are there and all of them say we support expropriation without compensation you know it's astounding to me uh, that business people uh, are, are so uh, out, out of kilter with what's right and you know uh, what's what's against their own interests um, so the banks have sort of said um, mm, it's a bit of a problem for us because uh, you know we have a lot of mortgages on farmland um, and if that land was taken um, we wouldn't have security anymore. Um, and I guess that would have repercussions for the rest of the economy. So maybe you shouldn't do it. But also, you know, the guilt and the associations with the past, and I guess is all we can do, and we haven't really thought about this properly. But the state would surely have to compensate the bank. Uh, there's an argument for they, it. At least they go so far as to say we're not compensating the bank too, which would, which would double the trouble. Yes. So if you're compensating the bank, what's the point? Okay. In other words, if you've got uh, a piece of land that uh, you know, you've borrowed 100 million rand for this farm and you owe it to the bank and the state says we're taking your land and I have to pay the bank, well, they're not better off. They haven't done much with their expropriation or compensation. Um, it's also, you know, if they, as an individual owner, you might think, well, if they're going to take it from me, I certainly better not be the one who pays for it. So let me borrow the money. Uh, and I'm sure the banks are wise enough there too and won't be very keen to lend people money on, on land. The best advice to a farm or a land is get mortgage. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Yes, uh, I th I'm, uh, I'm standing up with two motives. One is I think we need to be into a close. Uh, but then I do have two comments on which I'd like you to respond. Uh, and I prefix them with saying that I'm possibly an odd one out. I don't think that white owned 
than, than the rich white people. It's significantly at risk. And frankly, if I were on the board of the bank, I wouldn't bother much. Uh, and I want to point out that the first announcement of an expropriation without compensation, I think, in South Africa, as far as I know, was the shanty town called Marathon and Delport in Kuruven, uh, Germany. Uh, now, this is very peculiar. Not some property in Bryanston, not a rich farmer from Tondo's farm, not some speculative land held somewhere, but a shanty town. And, uh, and uh, they have an eviction order for all of the people there. It's a technical township, informal city as well. And uh, they've announced they want to expropriate it for housing development. So, 40,000 uh, impoverished, destitute black South Africans are going to be the first victims of expropriation without compensation, not some rich white person. And the reason I don't think white people have to worry very much is because if they try and take some rich white person's farm in France to pass in France, uh, they're going to face litigation. How many cases can they handle? The real victims will be poor people, because they will be essentially victims of defenseless. And this is what I understand the law to be. The DA asked in Parliament, what will the expropriation authority be? Well, the answer to that is thousands of petty government officials in every government department and agency at every level of government has the power to expropriate. And they expropriate to build a cemetery or extend a road or make a park or put a Eskom uh, transformer or whatever, police stations, schools, clinics, hospitals. And whose land are they going to take uh, when they want to build a community center in Alex? They will just give an eviction order to 20, 30, 40 people. Um, so I, I'm of the view that the real illusion that's taking place here is somehow that white people are the primary people at risk. I think there's a completely mistaken conception. It's, it's low-income people, most of them are black, who will be overwhelmingly the victims, and Cyril Ramaphosa will be nowhere near an actual expropriation. It will be the park's manager of Pofod that expropriates. And whose land will they expropriate? The land of the person who's going to put up the least resistance. Starting with uh, one of the biggest and poorest shanty towns in South Africa, uh, uh, and Telport, whose representative stood where you are now a week ago and explained why they oppose expropriation without compensation. I think poor black people would support it because they would somehow expect to be a beneficiary. The reality is they suddenly realized they will actually be the first and by far the biggest victims. So I just want you to, to address this mindset which people on both sides have. Unfortunately, most of the organizations you listed there see this in this racial thing. Somehow this is against whites for black people, and everyone on both sides is seeing that. I just think this is a giant illusion and a, and a huge mistake that is not out actually going to manifest itself. And when the president says it will not be done in a way that harms food security, he does not himself know who actually expropriates, which is the park's manager or the cemetery manager of a little village in the middle of nowhere. Those are the people who in fact expropriate, and they will be the ones with this power. I, I concur entirely. Uh, so you're right that um, it will be the poor and vulnerable and often black who will be the most abused, um, and those without access to you know, wealthy lawyers and Um to add one further thing, which is people forget that we live in a multi-party democracy, that the ANC doesn't govern the whole country, that uh, the DA, for example, govern a bunch of metros, okay, and that they would also have expropriating powers. Um, one of the places they do govern is Johannesburg, where the Tilly House is. So it's not clear to me that as the ANC, you want to, you want to give this weapon uh, to those across the aisle from you to say, Feel free to bludgeon us to death with it. Also, the electoral landscape may change. And once you've changed the constitution, it doesn't matter, as you say, what Soro Mapoza intends on doing. What about his successors in title? You know, Didi Mabuza is going to be next in line to wield this hammer ever he sees fit.
Um, so when crafting a legislative weapon, um, those in government must always recognize that it is a weapon that sits on the table that can be used by their enemies at a moment's notice. Thank you very much, guys.